Welcome to Sheboygan County Government. Working for you, my name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Testrudi. And today we have one of our esteemed colleagues, one of our 18 department heads, Greg Schnell, Transportation Director. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. It's good to have you here. As you know, every month we strive to focus on a different department, their roles, responsibilities, and more often than not, the department is here to speak to that. And Greg, a lot going on with uh, the warmer weather and tis the season for construction. But before we get into that, uh, please share with our viewers a little bit about yourself when you started as Transportation Director. I started in uh, October of 2006, so I'm approaching my ninth year. Um, I really love what's going on here. We're, we're getting a lot of stuff accomplished. Um, like we've talked about earlier, there's room for improvement, and we've always uh, strived to do our best with what we have. Um, but uh, we, we just, uh, in, in our business, when you go through the cycles that we do with winter and, and construction, those are only two seasons that we really care about, and that's when we have to get our, our, our things done. So we, we hate to be an inconvenience to people, but we still have to get things done at, at, the, at the time we need to get done at. So Yeah. Well, again, it's good to have you here. Start big picture. Talk a little bit about the Transportation Department's organizational structure. We, um, the, the transportation department is, 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 uh, is a combined with the highway department as well as the airport. Uh, we have 90 total employees, including myself. Um, we have three full-time people at the airport with a part-time and an 87 at, uh, at our operation on the highway division. Um, like I said, it's myself. We have uh, two highway superintendents. We have an, a couple of engineers, um, some office staff, and uh, about 60-some guys in the field that take care of the, the roads and the plowing and, and uh, working in the trucks as far as mechanics and welding. So, And as you said, it's now a combined department with the airport. Years ago, the airport was a separate, rather small department, but with a lot going on. What's the difference in budget with the highway division versus the airport division? The highway department relies on about uh, $4.5 million worth of levy a year. The airport is just shy of 200,000, 193 or 97. Um, so it's, uh, they, they, the airport gets a majority of their money from um, the levy as well as what we can take in from fuel sales uh, through our FBO. Our highway operations, the levy uh, is, is one part of it, but we, we do a lot of outside work for the state and uh, there's capital plan money. So we, overall, we have about a 13 to $14 million budget. 13, $14 million for transportation? Correct. And then the is that with the airport included? No, that's about four hundred thousand, and about four hundred thousand for the airport. So Correct. a lot of responsibility, ninety employees, and again a tremendous amount going on. Um, set the stage as well with, you know, I think our viewers and from time to time you and I and Roger run into people. Well, what's the difference between a, a highway that's under federal ownership versus a state road versus a county road versus a town road? You know, how, how do you distinguish these? The uh, state roads in our county are all numbered. Uh, I-43 is a federally funded highway um, because it has a, it's an interstate designation. State Highway 23, 57, those are state highways. So anything that has a number is owned by the state. Anything that has a letter is owned by the county. Anything that has a name is a township or a village street. Um, in some cases and throughout our county, we have county trunks that are in townships that um, just for an instance, uh, down in the town of Wilson, a lot of people call it Whedon, Whedon Creek Road. That's still our county trunk, it's county trunk EE. So there is some changes when, when, it goes, when it comes to the letters and the names, but it's the county's responsibility to take care of it. So the difference there is, is um, like I-43, that's a 24 hour coverage uh, highway for us during the winter months. Um, it falls off with State Highway 23 a little bit to an 18, 18 hour road, and ours are just covered as needed during the winter months, it's a, it's a little different story with, with a couple different shifts of people, but that's the difference. And who do you determine who's responsible for taking care of what? The, uh, as far as the maintenance of those, right. we right. have to work with uh, the DOT. They give us kind of a, a, a punch <clears throat> list, if you will, of things that they would like to have done on their roads. So they contract with us to do that. Uh, our highway department is also contracted with um, 11 of the 15 townships in, in Sheboygan County um, to take care of their maintenance, such as the grass cutting, pothole patching, snow removal, um, you name it. If it has to do with the road or the right way, we're taking care of it for them. So county highway department taking care of the state trunk roadways, the county roadways, 
and in some cases the town or municipality roadways if they're contracting with us. That's correct. And big picture, just how many miles of roadway are you responsible for? It, uh, it breaks down that we have, um, there's 450 miles of county trunk that, we, that, we're, that our, we're the maintenance uh, authority for, um, 170 miles of state road, and 465 miles of township road. So all together, it adds up there. I think it's over like 2,200 miles of, of road that we're, we're taking care of. Which is a lot of pavement to take care of and why people need to be a little patient. After a snowstorm, they're not necessarily gonna get their road dealt with within the first few minutes or first few hours. I imagine you have a priority system in place. Correct, it's usually we take care of the state um, highway system first. Every, all of our guys go out, we, we send out 43 to 45 trucks on the first round, they will get, uh, they'll take care of the county trunks and state roads first, and then we'll break off into the lower volume roads. Um, so it, it, it is, it, timing's everything in, in, in snow removal, and it, uh, it becomes difficult as the, as the event increases, but uh, we're here to take care of it. So. Yeah, you do a heck of a good job. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, Roger, turn it over to you. Thank you, Adam, and um, having served on the county board for a number of years, I've developed quite an appreciation for all the work that the highway department does for the county, road, state, and the local uh, municipalities appreciate your efforts and uh, do appreciate that. Well, thank you. Uh, but uh, tell us some of the benefits the county provides, whether it's to the state, town, or villages uh, by having the entire operation. How does that help them? and? reduce the cost of services in general? I think one of the biggest benefits that, that, that it is is they're not duplication of services. You know, the state doesn't have to have their own particular highway department and buying additional equipment and, addition, and having additional staff and, and purchasing different materials. Um, so having it all underneath one jurisdiction, you have better control. Um, no duplication, plus you get the usage on the equipment, whereas if, if we were just using it strictly on our state highways, we wouldn't recoup as much um, equipment revenue and, and rent off of it, and it would just be sitting. It's, it's, it, would, it just benefits the department better to, to keep all the wheels turning at one point and sharing those services throughout. And uh, why don't you explain a little bit about the asphalt operations, where it's located, uh, how much material you use in a year, and uh, we produce some of our own and uh, some of those things. Sure. We, um, we have an asphalt plant that's uh, stationed out in the town of Greenbush, right off of State Highway 23. Uh, the county has purchased that many, many, many years ago. Um, it has proven to be uh, a very valuable piece. Obviously, if you have 450 miles of, of, of paved highway, they need to be taken care of. Um, our operation, we, we, uh, we produce anywhere between 40 to 90,000 tons a year, depending upon um, if we have a, a big customer base that year where we have some projects outside of our operation that have to go. Um, and it depends upon the cost of the oil. Annually, we, we bid out our oil just to see where we're gonna be at, and, and obviously that drives how much work we can um, do. We uh, have gained some efficiencies over the years with um, adding a bag house to take out some of the dust that's better for the environment, as well as uh, adding a, uh, re a recycled asphalt um, miller, which uh, breaks down old asphalt that was on the road, brought back to the plant, run back through. So we're reutilizing re re the oil that's in there as well as the aggregate. So we've reduced the cost of our, of our um, asphalt, the, the raw product at the end, by about $4 a ton just to keep us in, the, in, in more of an efficient uh, state and we can get more work done that way. And besides the uh, levy uh, on our tax bills, what are some of the other sources that help fund uh, improving some of the road projects and what sources are available? Over the last, uh, I believe since 2008, the county board has allowed um, the highway department to, to utilize the five-year capital plan for some of our larger projects and, and giving us that um, an extra boost in investing in our, our pavements. We've been doing a lot more pulverizing, uh, which is, is turning the asphalt over and uh, regrading and put down a fresh mat um, to, to um, to protect the base and the surface when they get to the point that they deteriorated so far. So that's one of our um, 
one of our areas that, that helps offset our budget as well as we have the ability to apply for uh, CHIP funds. It's a, it's a county highway improvement fund through the state as well as the SDP program, which is a federal, federal and state funded uh, program. Those don't happen every year, it's every other year is when we have the ability to apply for those funds. And what is the typical life of a blacktop surface on a, a local or a county road? Uh, studies indicate we should be getting 15 mile or 15 years out of a pavement. Um, however, you know that a lot of that has to do with the, the type of industry that could be along that road, um, generating more traffic, ADTs, that type of stuff. Whether it's farm traffic, um, um, large manufacturing, those are the things that drive. So if you get a road that only carries 50, 60 cars a day, and it's it's typically just cars, it could give you 30 years of life. We have we have some of our roads we haven't touched for a long time, other than just some little bit of maintenance in order to um, to, to keep up with the with, with some of the rutting and and deterioration that's out there. And I'm sure there's a lot of engineering and planning for uh, reconstruct and uh, how is that similar or, or what are the differences between that and a regular overlay or maintenance done on routinely on roads? A lot of what drives our reconstruction is volume of traffic. Um, there's, again, going back to the amount of roads that we have in our, our county, not every one of them needs to be constructed to a typical section where you have 80 feet of right of way and a 30 foot top. Because obviously, as I mentioned, uh, with 50 cars on, you wouldn't need to have uh, that type of cross section on it. So we, we look at, the, at, our, at, our, at our system to the connecting highways, whether it's connecting to a state highway or across the county uh, where it makes sense. And if there's a, vo a large volume of traffic, we want to improve that to make sure we have decent drainage, a wide uh, uh, pavement, and decent shoulders. Now, if we're going to look at a maintenance p uh, job, we a every other year we, uh, <coughs> we uh, rate our roads through the system that the state has provided us and gives us a... a kind of a life cycle of when we should be doing what next, whether it's a seal coat or crack filling, and that's determined by the age of the pavement. Uh, after the first couple of years of putting down a new pavement, we want to be looking at the cracks to prevent the water from getting into the base. Um, five, 10, 5 to 15 years out, you might be looking at a seal coat and then looking at overlay. So we're always looking to see what that next investment and, and the next area we're going to be headed to. And I'm sure that helps you determine which roads need to be resurfaced or rebuilt, and um, the rating system helps you do that. But it's always uh, looking at the roads itself and what parts of them get more traffic. I'm sure that at some intersections, they get a lot more traffic that length of road than the the entire length of the road. That makes a difference too. I'm sure. You bet. You know, and, and in our environment, um, with the winter and you get the free saw cycles. Some years we may not have had that road on a um, on our on our pavement cycle, but due to frost, the heaves, and that type of stuff, um, eventually it has a wear and tear on the on the road as well. We may have to put the road that was in line and reprioritize because of a, of a spring breakup in order to fix up a road that wasn't there the year before or didn't have that issue the year before. And what are the primary uh, road construction projects you have going on this year? We're finishing up the County Trunk LS project, which is a, a mammoth project for us. Uh, it was um, redoing eight miles of, of uh, Dairyland Drive and uh, doing the same on County Trunk LS, which is now Lakeshore Drive, and relocating the road from, from the east of these residents' homes to the west side of these residents' homes. We're probably within about a month um, of, of completing the project, um, and that one will be great to get off the books. I'll be uh, happy to, to see that one done. Um, from there, we're going to go down to the intersection of uh, County Trunk A and EE -E and put a, a roundabout in, as well as uh, improve the road section from State Highway 28 to that intersection. Um, we have, uh, we're looking at a paving project out here on County Trunk A. Um, between 28 and uh, County Trunk PP, which would be a pulverized and paved job, so it's going to be a little bit bigger than a normal overlay. So uh, those are just to name a few. Well, uh, thank you again for all the work that uh, you and your crews do, and it's much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you very much. Greg, earlier, uh, Roger asked you some questions about the, you know, the roads and how they 
how you plan accordingly to maintain them over time. And you gave a nice high-end overview of that. And I've also heard you give a nice high-end overview to folks like our county board and heads of local government about, you know, if you have to do that overlay in 15 years, and if you don't, then what happens in the cost? Please run through that hypothetical from to give our viewers a sense of the cost associated with taking just care of one mile of road. The, um, the cost to, to overlay a mile of road runs about $120,000 a, a mile. If, if we're not going to take care of that or keep up with that type of a system and we'll allow that pavement to break down and deteriorate to the next level, then we'd come in with a pulverizer and have to pulverize that pavement and get down into the gravel, bring it all back up, relay it. Now all of a sudden we've just went from 120 to 250. If we're gonna continue to kick the can down the road and not do what we should be doing, our next investment is gonna be a million plus in order to rebuild the road if we're not taking care of the drainage and the, the, the cracks. So it goes 120, 250, all the way to a million. I mean, there's a couple levels in between there, obviously, but um, if we're gonna let it go, you know, the, the costs get extreme. So as a community and as taxpayers and as legislators or a governor or Congress, all those levels of government, if you're gonna be fiscally responsible, it's pretty clear that it makes sense to maintain your roads as you go rather than, as you said, delay that and inevitably play, pay twice as much or 10 times as much. You're, you're absolutely correct. And, and you know, unfortunately, um, over the years when tight budgets, highway operations were typically the ones to see the cut up front. And a lot of that is because you know, you have some flexibility to allow some of that maintenance and paving slide a little bit because you don't see the immediate effects. But if we continue to let that happen, right. now you're paying a lot more, a lot more into the future. Some of our viewers may have followed of late in the, in the press or uh, in the media that there's been some discussion at, as part of the state budget development that prevailing wage law is being looked at. And I imagine most people are don't have a real good feel for, well, how does prevailing wage law impact the cost of doing road construction? Please try to, in a thimble, uh, explain that to folks so they can understand, well, what's being debated? What's the issue right now? Prevailing wage is a wage that's paid to, to employees on a um, government-funded, uh, municipal-funded project um, that, had, that meets a threshold, a dollar threshold. The dollar threshold is 234000 whether that's a building project or a road project, um, along those lines. And that, that wage is, is established by the DOT, or by the, 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 uh, the Department of Commerce, I believe it is, uh, and it's, it's a, a data-driven uh, estimate of, of, of all the uh, wages that they pull together for construction companies, and that's how they develop that, that prevailing wage. Um, prevailing wages are it was something that was set up a long, long time ago. I don't know the entire history of that, um, but it can drive a project anywhere between 10 and 15 to 25 percent higher um, in comparison to paying just a regular wage. Um, so it's it's. Uh, Currently, the, the, way, the, the way the prevailing wage law is, is structured that if, if my department was to work for a town in Sheboygan County and the project is going to be over $100,000, my employees would need to get paid prevailing wage, which then would be tacked onto the township's bill. Um, if the private sector was going to be doing that same job and it doesn't meet the $234,000 threshold, they would not have to pay the prevailing wage. So there's a disparity between the private sector and the county um, operations. So um, I believe that's some of the structure or some of the reasons for some of the changes. Um, they're talking about raising the thresholds to into the millions of dollars. Um, I mean, what's ironic, it's, it's kind of a double hit not only are they treating the private sector and public sector differently with a different threshold, you said $100,000 versus $234,000. So not only does the public's threshold kick in sooner, therefore as taxpayers we're paying more, but also um, you know, the prevailing wage just bottom line is a higher cost than what counties or generally local units of government pay their staff to do road, road improvement projects. So really, it's two areas of concern. 
And what I find remar remarkable, and I know Chairman DeStruti and the county board uh, has voiced strong concern with our area legislators, as you know, Greg, and they're very supportive of some type of reform. Uh, when we're talking about the tremendous cost associated with transportation and maintaining our network, transportation network, yet here we're asking taxpayers to pay 10, 15, 20 percent more. And why? That could be resources going into taking care of more of our roadways and not pushing or kicking that can down the road to more expensive costs long term. It's, um, you know, it's been something I've, I've been getting a lot of questions on lately and, and uh, I'm no means, um, I don't mean to understand it all yet, but when I start to think about how prevailing wage is developed and, and it's a, a, a dollar threshold driven on the cost of a project, when I look at the cost of an overlay, $82,000 is materials. So the wages is only like 20000 but because of the dollar threshold, so you would think that it would be something, maybe something could be different just based on the wages. If that's over 100000 now all of a sudden it would kick in. Right. So I think there's different ways to play with that a little bit, but again, the prevailing wage has been around a long time. Right. And um, you know, maybe it has something to do with uh, most of these positions. They, 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 they aren't year-round work, and you know, they need to have that extra. I mean, everything ebbs and flows. But right now, bottom line, it really uh, provides an advantage to the private sector. And if the private sector was providing uh, a lower cost to take care of our roads, well, that would be a good thing. But in fact, it's the opposite. It's costing taxpayers more to utilize private operators to do this maintenance. And we need to level that playing field, I think. So I, I think that was a nice explanation. Thank you, Greg. And thank you for the information you've been sharing with our legislators and at least encouraging that some type of reform be considered. Um, moving along, let's return back to the airport a little bit. Focus most of our time on highway department operations. Again, we have the highway division, the airport division. Uh, what's happening out at the airport? What's new there? Um, right now we're just preparing. Uh, this year is a down year for any type of construction projects out at the airport. We have a, a few little things that are going on. Um, uh, we're working at uh, putting some fiber in, that type of thing, to, to help our, our tenants out there um, have better access. Um, we just completed last year the, the apron area out in front of the Aviation Heritage Center. So this year we're in design for um, a few projects that are coming up. Uh, it's some pavement projects on the, in the, on the GA uh, taxiway, but a lot of that is, is uh, self-induced that we are not doing any construction because of the PGA that's coming up in August. So we didn't want to be having all things ripped up and, and uh, because that generates a lot of activity for our airport when they start coming in for the PGA. Um, so we're working on just tidying things up, cleaning up. Uh, there's a lot of maintenance that, um, that hasn't been done for a while, so we're taking care of that. It's just a lot of activity happening out yeah. there. Yeah, there is a lot of activity happening. If you've never been to your Sheboygan County Memorial Airport, I encourage you to get out there. We always have, what, wings and wheels on Father's Day, which has been a long-standing activity that I think a lot of people enjoy and take part in. But I still hear from time to time people who don't recognize that Sheboygan County owns an airport and it's a pretty significant airport in fact greg just how large is our airport and how busy is it in comparison to other public airports across the state we have over a thousand acres altogether um, 700 and i think 30 it may be inside the fence so i mean it's a lot of grass to cut and, and there's several miles of runway and taxiway that have to be plowed and maintained um, so it's it's uh as far as uh, landings and takeoffs, I don't have that committed to memory, but it, it's, it's pretty steady. If memory serves, because I just read your annual report that uh, Charles Sweet, your airport manager, put together, I think it's like the seventh busiest public airport in the, in the state. So as you said, a lot going on. And I know Chairman Distruti and I just the other day were talking about how the county board over time has supported extending the runways, and the runways now are to such a length that we can handle pretty much the biggest aircrafts out there, can we not? About 93,000 pounds is what we can, and you can go a little bit larger than that, but uh, if, you know, if we had to land something a little bit larger, we could, but you wouldn't want that because it's hard on the pavements. But yeah, we, uh, we can take in a lot of stuff. The small charter planes or that type of a business development, that's something that we can handle now. And if no one's ever been to the Sheboygan County Airport before, and you take TT to the north off of Highway 23, and uh, if they don't get that chance, or again, have never been there, 
in a snapshot just what kind of activity is out there? What kind of tenants do we have? What kind of hustle and bustle is happening there? We have uh, five commercial um, tenants. That's like an industrial, the, the Kohlers, the Bemises, the Richardsons, and we have um, eight industri industry, um, which is all along the same lines. We have uh, geospatial, aerometric. They, they do a lot of flying. Um, and then there's also 39 uh, general aviation, just for guys that have their own little plane that, that fly around. So. Um, Going back to some of the events we have this year, we, you know, we have a, um, the T-28s come back annually and that's usually right before the EAA fly-in. Well, this year there's about 100 more planes that are called the, the Air Coops will be there as well. So that is the week to be out there. The week before EAA, you're going to see probably close to 300 planes buzzing around our airport and, and uh, doing some of their training. And of course, Wings and Wheels, I presume, is scheduled for Father's Day again? That's correct, yep. And then uh, we've got the PGA, now I'm testing my memory, it's mid August 15th? Or I believe so, yes. 15th through the 20th or right around in that ballpark, and I, I often hear people will go out there to do a little celebrity watching yep. at the airport during yep. that week. There's a lot of iron that's brought in that A lot week, of iron. So. Well, my compliments to you and your team on the oversight of the highway division the airport division, the transportation department as a whole. Greg, Thank you. as Roger and our board knows, is one of those department heads that has stepped up and taken on additional responsibility. We consolidated these two departments a few years ago, and uh, Greg Schnell has shouldered that and does an excellent job. And at the onset, I think you said, what has it been now, nine years? It will be nine years in October. I guess the honeymoon period is <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have really enjoyed working with you, and I personally consider not only Greg an outstanding co-worker, but a friend, and uh, thank you for your leadership, Greg. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next month, we're going to have a new face sitting across uh, the uh, coffee table from Roger and I. It's going to be Melody Lorgi. She is our new circuit clerk of courts. She's been in the department, I think, for nearly 25 years, although you wouldn't know it looking at her. She's a young lady who just took on a very important role as leader of the clerk of court's office, uh, took over from uh, Nan Todd, who had been that elected department head for a number of years. So looking forward to introducing you to Melody, if you've never heard from her, and learning more about the important work that our clerk of court staff do. So until then, thank you for joining us. And if you have it, any questions or suggestions for improvement, don't hesitate to contact any of us or your county board supervisor. Again, thanks for joining us and have a good summer.